very few accomplishments that mean so much to our lives than graduation, whether it's a high school diploma or whether it's a college diploma. It is set and focused in what we are going to try to do into the future. It gives us a door, a pathway into doing something for our life, for our calling. And today we'd like to honor our graduates. We'd like to honor anyone that graduated this year or is going to graduate this year from other high school or maybe it's your associate's degree or your bachelor's degree or maybe somebody received a doctorate degree or maybe it's a trade school but it, you're walking through a door of opportunity that you have prepared for that you have studied for and you've graduated from and it's opening up a door so we can say thank you and what we're going to do is we're going to give you a piece of paper with a little bow around it it's not a diploma or anything what it is it's your information and what we would like to do for all the graduates is we'd like you to fill this information out. And the church would like to buy you a, a graduation Bible. So you could take it with you and you can just remember that this day that God has blessed you for a future. And also it's the word of God that's going to guide you and light your path every step of the way. If you are a graduate, we have four high school graduates right down here. But if you are a graduate from a, a, a college, a trade school, nursing school, or any college or any graduation form, would you make your way up to the platform at this time? We'd like to honor you, and let's give them a round of applause as they make their way up. Thank you for being here. I'd like to ask you just to walk up to the microphone and tell us who you are, where you're graduating from, and what are your plans for the next phase of your life? I'm Josh Stroke Camp. I'm graduating from campus, and I'm going to K-State, and I haven't decided what I'm majoring in yet. K-State, awesome. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I'm Kendrick Kilmani. I'm graduating from Mays High School. I'm going to Hutch for music. Hang on, hang on. Oh. You're too short, honey. You <laughs> My name is Michaela Palmer. I graduated from Goddard High School, and I'm going to go to WTC to be a CNA. Okay. I am Kelsey Letourneau, and I'm graduating from Campus High School, and I'm currently getting my CNA at Cali County, and I attend on going to Johnson County Community College to be a registered nurse who specializes in missionary work. I'm Shelly Fultz and I just graduated from ABC Animal College as a vet tech and hopefully going on to be a vet. Hello, I'm David McCumbers, and I'm in a training program at the University of Kansas a School of Social uh, Work, and I'm trained to be a certified spear, uh, peer specialist for the um, mental health field. Hello, I'm uh, Colby Wilcox. I'm graduating from Vatterock College this year and wind energy technician. Okay. Thank you. I'm Karina Wyatt, and I'm a little different. I have already graduated, and I just wanted to come up here and just say congratulations to all of you. I really don't need that, but this is such an honor, and I'm sorry for interrupting this, but it was just, it means a lot to see you guys up here, and for somebody that dropped out and had to start over. So this is something that I had to say congratulations. Thank you guys. Maybe. The future. What in the world does the future have in store? When you think about the future, we think about our lives and you think about the church. Think about what God has started within you. What is it within your life that's deep within your soul? Things that drive you with passion. Things that make you get up in the morning and to drive you to work or drive you to study. 
What is it that gives you that inner peace within your life? And when we find what God has gifted you in, and you have a passion for, that is the thing that we have to strive to accomplish within our life. We have to finish well. We have to move within our life. And what we start within our life, we have to evaluate on the road of life. And if we do not evaluate in our life how we are accomplishing the goal that God has set in front of us, sometimes when we do not evaluate it, it becomes stagnated. And sometimes we fail because we didn't put a clear mental picture of what God has in store for our life. And we have graduates from high school, graduates from college, and what we want to do today is we want to inspire them and at the same time inspire you because we are all on paths. We may not be 19 years of age, graduated from high school. We may be 50 years of old, 50 years of age, moving into the last phase of our life. But you know what? If we don't evaluate where we're going and what we're going to do, it'd be very easy to just stagnate, to decline, and even suffer. So we have our youth pastors that are going to be sharing with us today. And one of the things I really love about our youth ministry is this. Ben and Rachel grew up in our youth ministry. They graduated high school at this church. Then they went off to college. They came back. They have a passion for our students. And they have a passion and a love for this church. And early in my ministry, I was trained with saying this. If you're not willing to volunteer to serve God without any remuneration, just love God. And if you will serve God because you love God, and then you get to pay, get paid to do what you get to do, that is not a job. That is a blessing of God. And Ben and Rachel, I've been watching them for the last two years, and I have seen them grow in, in every form of youth ministry. I'm proud that they are youth pastors. I think they are doing a phenomenal job. And uh, if you could see their heart and their energy and their passion to, to do whatever it needs to be done, they are doing, and it's, it's unbelievable that they do this, they are doing their youth ministry work. And they, they have secular jobs. And they come in on Wednesdays. And they do what other youth pastors do in a seven-day window. They do it in a Wednesday window and then performance on, Saturday, on Sunday. So they're doing everything that they could do on a one-day work week at the church. And uh, the bad thing is, if you've heard Rachel, her office is right across from mine. And, oh, man, on Wednesdays, I don't get anything done. They get everything done, but they talk all the time. So I, ne I need you to do this right now. I need you to put your seatbelt on because Rachel is going to share, okay? So which means turbo for 15 minutes. I'm just telling you right now. I love her to death. She can work anybody under the table, I guarantee you. So let's make Ben and Rachel welcome as they come up and share with us. Hey, just real quick. Sorry, I'm going to start. I didn't tell you this, but... Oh. Um, People always, you know, when we come up and we talk, they always say all these nice things about us. But I just wanted to reiterate that um, our success is everybody's success because of the people that invest in our lives, whether it be our parents or the staff or even you guys out here. So we appreciate everybody else. Just before we uh, came in here, we had a whole group of guys that just laid hands on us and prayed for us for, for this right here. So everybody else around us supports us and it facilitates our success. So we appreciate that too. Well, this is making me feel a little emotional up here. <laughs> Um, I, was gonna, I wasn't going to say this, but it's kind of funny. Pastor says how I, I do talk a lot in the thing. And last week I had posted on Facebook. I had all these amazing ideas to come share with him. And then he wasn't here on Wednesday, and I was kind of bummed. So I texted him. I was like, he went off to Texas to a pastor's conference. And I said, did you have to run off so I wouldn't distract you all day with my, all my ideas? So it's kind of funny. But next week, this week, all my ideas. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> so... Um, well, we're here today to talk about graduation. Um, I'm amazed at how fast this year has flown by. It seems like we were just doing this with our last uh, group of kids, and now we have four wonderful seniors who are 
getting ready to graduate um, in the next two weeks. And it's such an exciting time, but it's really a sad time for me because it's so amazing getting to be with them every Wednesday and Sunday and then doing different events. We got to have after prom with them. And um, it's just very cool to watch them grow up. And I'm sure many of you have seen them through the years as they've grown up here. But uh, it's really exciting, but it's sad to, to let them go and um, move on from us. So I enjoy being with them. So they're great kids. Um, I do have a story for you about Kendrick Kiamani. Kendrick, raise, raise your hands so I know who we're talking about. Okay, Kendrick, when he was a kindergartner at Mays Elementary School, Benjamin here was about in eighth grade at Mays uh, Middle School. This is a good story. And um, they happened to, the schools kind of did a thing. It was called like a, a buddy reading time. And so Benjamin's class would go over to the elementary school, and they were paired up randomly with a kindergarten class and then a kindergarten student. And Ben and Kendrick were paired up as reading buddies, and it was Ben's job to teach him to read and to learn and different little things. They were working together. Also and it, stole him extra cookies. Also, Ben stole him extra cookies, and so they really bonded. But it's kind of cool seeing now how, at that time, they had no clue how their lives were going to be intertwined in the future. And so it went from just being reading buddies from that one year into now the relationship they have as Ben being his youth pastor for the last several years. And so it's pretty cool to see how God works and sets us on paths, which is what we're going to talk about today early on in our lives. Um, for the past, uh, we all have a past, actually, that leads us into our future. Graduates today are finishing up 12 years of school. Some of you from college, you'll be doing 14 or 16 years of school. Um, you guys have been learning and growing and maturing into the people that you are today. Who are, you are, who are you becoming at this very moment? Some of us have made choices in life that are good, some bad, and some ugly. But they've all shaped our futures. Um, your parents, teachers, pastors, friends, and family members have all given you tools throughout your life as you've developed. I want to talk to you guys all about fear for a second. Seniors, um, this is for you guys, but also it's something that we can all relate to at different points in our lives. You guys, some of you are going to be living far away from home, and that can be scary sometimes. Going for a job interview can feel traumatic and nerve-wracking. Um, not having friends when you go to a new place that have cared about you and grown up with you can be a little devastating. But God has not given us a spirit of fear. It's God's will to move you from fear to confidence. You're called to live courageously and to trust in the enablement of God's spirit. Though you guys are young and inexperienced right now, Allow God to move in and through your lives in this next phase of your life. Um, sorry. God can and will use your life, but you must be willing to face your fears. Saying yes to Christ on a secular college campus is a courageous thing, while facing fears of being stereotyped. Saying yes to a godly lifestyle in a difficult job is a courageous thing, while facing ridicule. Saying no to drugs and parties you're invited to is a courageous thing for facing fear of being alone, especially in a new place. Staying in a marriage that has hit a major roadblock or a dead end is a courageous thing in facing the fear of a life with unfulfilled expectations. Saying yes to honesty and integrity in academics and the business world is facing the fear of a bad grade or a lost job and income. One of the biggest battles you will face is honesty, and dishonesty is the root of fear. When we trusted in Jesus Christ as our uh, Savior, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our lives. He provides the continuous comfort that we need to eliminate our fears. With God in control, we can face our fears. He gives us the ability to do what life demands, to love when others hate, and to be under control when others throw restraint to the wind. This is a quote from Max Lucado, who's one of my favorite authors. Fear doesn't want you to make the journey to the mountain. If he can rattle you enough, Fear will persuade you to take your eyes off the peaks and settle for a dull existence in the flatlands. So don't give in to fear. Don't take your eyes off those mountains as you guys are moving on and you have all these things ahead of you. Keep your eye on the mountain and don't settle. Isaiah 41, 14 says, For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. So in those times of fear and doubt, Allow him to grab your hand and to carry you through because I guarantee you he will if you ask him. Sometimes it's just needing us to remember that he will hold us and he will carry us. And to stop and pause, take a deep breath, and allow him to carry us. 
Graduation is a big turning point in your life. Many of you guys have had several graduations already. There's preschool graduation, kindergarten graduation, fifth grade graduation, eighth grade graduation, and now the big one, high school graduation. Um, this is where you guys are going to step out with the tools you've been given this far. You're going to have a lot more freedom and responsibilities, and we're going to see which ones you choose. Today I want to talk to everyone about 12 ordinary people in the Bible. Don't freak out, that sounds like a lot, but it'll be fast. <laughs> There are people who were not without faults. They had shortcomings. None of them was a scholar or a rabbi. They had no extraordinary skills. They were ordinary people, just like each one of us in this room. I'm talking about the 12 disciples. I'm going to turn to Matthew 10, 2 through 4 for a second, if you want to, and tell you who they are. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother is Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. The word disciple refers to a learner or a follower. They were ordinary men, among them fishermen, tax collector, a revolutionary, a doctor, the gospel records their constant failings, struggles, and doubts. As I was studying this, I came across a few facts that, about each disciple. Who can you identify with? The first one we have is Peter. One minute he's walking on water by faith, the next he's sinking in doubt. He's emotional and impulsive. He's most famously known for denying Christ when the pressure was on. He was oft, often also the spokesman for the twelve. Andrew. He left John the Baptist to become the first follower of Jesus of Nazareth. He also lived in the shadow of his brother Simon Peter. How many of us feel like we live in the shadow of our siblings or other people? James. He was often called James the Greater to distinguish him from the other apostle named James. Now, I thought this was funny. I'll tell you about it later. But the other apostle was named James the Less. So uh, that would be hard for me because I'm so competitive. I would not want to be James the Less. So <laughs> I'd be James the Greater. At least I think so. But. Um, James, along with John, earned a special nickname from the Lord. They were called the Sons of Thunder. He was also the first of the twelve disciples to be martyred. John, this is me all the way, so listen to it and you can laugh if you want, but it's very me. Uh, he's the brother of James, the other son of thunder. He liked to call himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. And I like to refer to myself as the child whom my parents love the most. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's very true, sadly, probably. It's mostly in my head, but I think it's maybe it's a little true. I don't know. But, uh, you know, you love your children all the same, but there's that one special sparkling star. <laughs> so, mostly I refer to it myself as he referred to himself as this. Um, he has a fiery temperament and a larger-than-life personality. He raised Peter to the tomb after it was reported that it was empty, and then he bragged to everyone how he won and got there first. That is also very much me. Philip, he was an encourager. He called Nathaniel to come and join and follow Christ. Nathaniel, he had a jarring first encounter with Christ. He was skeptical, but he followed along anyways. When Philip introduced him to Jesus, the Lord declared, Here is the true Israelite, in whom nothing is false. Immediately, Nathaniel wanted to know, How do you know me? Jesus got his attention when he said, I saw you while you were sitting under the fig tree before Philip called you. Shocked and surprised, he declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, and you are the King of Israel. How many of us follow along sometimes when we're a little skeptical, we're not sure? Or how many of us even entered our Christian life through that? You heard the story, and you were kind of like, meh, but you followed along with it anyways. And then God showed you amazing things through that. He reveals himself to you. That's kind of how Nathaniel was. Matthew, he was hated by a lot of people because he was a tax collector. He taxed imports and exports based on his own judgments. He longed to be accepted and loved by others. He recognized Jesus as someone who was worth sacrificing for. Thomas. He's referred to as Doubting Thomas. He refused to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead until he physically touched his wounds in his hands. Thomas, like some of us, was prone to extremes. Early on, he dem demonstrated courageous faith. 
willing to risk his own life to follow Jesus. Thomas is a great person to study. If we're truly seeking to know the truth and we're honest with ourselves and others about our struggles and our doubts, God will faithfully meet us and reveal himself to us just like he did with Thomas. James the Less, this is the one I would not want to be. Well, just the name. Um, now, um, he's one of the more obscure apostles. We don't know much about him, but we know he was in the upper room after Christ's, um, for Christ's ascension into heaven. Simon the Zealot, he's kind of a mystery too. He introduces us to some riddles in the Bible. He's mentioned in three places, and we do know that he was also in the upper room. Thaddeus, also known as Jude, he's characterized as a gentleman, tender-hearted and displayed a childlike humility. It's believed that he wrote Jude with the closing two verses, one of the finest expressions of praise to God in the whole New Testament. Judas Iscariot, many of us know him. He's the apostle who betrayed Jesus with a kiss. For this supreme act of treachery, some would say Judas Iscariot made the greatest error in history. People have mixed feelings about him. Some experience hatred towards him, others feel pity, and some even consider him to be a hero. No matter how you react to him, one thing is certain. As believers, we can really benefit from studying a li his life. So who are you like? Who can you identify with? E each of these men were simple, ordinary men. After witnessing Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven, the Holy Spirit transformed these disciples into powerful men of God who turned the world upside down. Will you be like them? Ordinary men who otherwise may not have been that important until they met Jesus. When I was, when I was writing this lesson, uh, until they met Jesus, it just kind of it stuck out to me. And it, it, it lingered with me for a little bit. And so... Um, I kind of made it the, the focal point of this because uh, it, it implies something. It's such a powerful, awesome statement because it implies uh, that before they met Jesus, they had their own goals. They had their own plans, their own dreams, their own aspirations. They had their own vision for what their life was going to be like, much like we all do. You guys are all have, you have your own plans and your own things and you, these ideas of how you think that it's going to be. But I want you to put yourself in their shoes just for a minute. Um, they might not have had everything planned out from the beginning, uh, but they were on a set path. They had a heading and they had a direction for their life and a place that they wanted to go. Um, much like you guys who are about to graduate and kids that I see graduate all the time. Um, sometimes you commit to a nice college and sometimes you just jump right into the workforce and sometimes, I don't know, maybe you just want to be a hobo on the side of the road. It doesn't really matter what it is, but you have a plan and you have a path and a desire for your own life. Um, well, these disciples, they were on the path as well um, until they met Jesus. And, and he changed that path. He altered that path. Let me ask you something. If I, got, if I talked to you guys last week and I said, hey, guys, all of you, I want you to just drop everything you're doing. Put it down. Throw it away. Stop what you're doing. Put your plans aside and just come and follow me. What would you say? Most of you would tell me to get lost, right? There's maybe this one kid, I don't know if Dakota Huckabee's in here. He would maybe, Dakota, raise your hand. If I said, Dakota, come follow me around all day, every day, he'd be like, all right, let's go. That's it. Nobody else would. Why? Because I'm just a regular guy. I'm nobody. I'm just a regular guy. Uh, let me read Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, if you have your Bible. It says, in Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. He called them and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So here we have, we have regular guys. We have fishermen. We have hard-working guys that are just doing their own thing until they met Jesus. And God says, I can use you. You regular guys, you guys that have no otherwise significance to the world, I can use you in my ministry. And for Jesus, that's all it took. It took one statement, one conversation, and these guys were sold. 
they were all in because they knew who he was. He wasn't just regular Jack Wagon Ben. He was Jesus Christ, and they knew it. And so they dropped everything that they had immediately. They left their father. They left their boats. They left their lives, essentially, and they just followed him. For others, for men like Paul, it took a little nudging. And for some of you parents out there, um, I think you might know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you, ha you have your kids, right? Maybe they're being a little difficult, and you have something that you want them to do or accomplish, and maybe it just takes a little nudge. But the thing about nudges is some nudges are harder than other nudges. Um, sometimes maybe it's your hand on their back or their shoulder gently guiding them or leading them across the street, and other times you're dragging them, grabbing an arm or an ear or a finger or a leg or something, and you're just pulling them, right? Some nudges are harder than others. Um, Paul needed a nudge because he was on a path. He thought he was on the right path, but God, God changed his path, gave him a little nudge. And uh, I'm going to read Acts chapter 9 really quick, verses 1 through 9. It says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So here we have Paul. He's walking down the street, and it says he's still breathing murderous threats. And um, this is, I'm sorry, this is Saul, who's later known as Paul. And um, he's heading down the road, road to Damascus, and he's seeking permission slips to persecute God, which was just funny to me. You have permission slips seeking to persecute God and persecute other Christians. That is, until he met Jesus. And Saul met Jesus maybe a little harder, in my opinion, than some other people may have met Jesus, um, because God blinds him right there on the street. He opens up the heavens and he blinds him on the road to Damascus. And he says, what are you doing? Why, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting my people? And he even tells them, he says, it's difficult to kick against the goads. And I didn't, I had the idea. I get, I get what God's saying in there, but I didn't really know what that meant. I was just kind of read over and had the, the basic understanding of what that meant. But I didn't really know what it was. And apparently, um, when somebody is farming or plowing, um, they're pushing the, the plow, the, the ox is pushing the plow, and when, when it doesn't want to go, there's a goad, which is a sharp piece of metal that they will kind of insert or nudge into the animal to make it go. And sometimes the animal is just being stubborn and will kick back against it, therefore furthering the pain that is being inflicted upon it to make it do what it has. And essentially that's God saying, stop struggling. Stop fighting. It's difficult. You're just going to hurt yourself. Just do what I want you to do. Listen to me and follow me because that's the way it's going to be. I, I imagine that um, Saul did what any of us would do. If the heavens spread and you were blinded in the middle of the street and a voice came out and said, I want you to do this, your immediate response is going to be, yes, sir, right? That's, it's just done. I've been blinded on the street and somebody's talking to me from the sky. You got it. Whatever you want. There's, there's, no other, there's no other real choice here. But that's the key. Um, listening, accepting, having the faith to make your dreams, the things that you want for your lives, the plans that you have for your lives, making those God's, God's dreams and taking and accepting and listening to those plans. For some, it will be easy, kind of like Andrew and Simon. Um, you'll spend your time seeking him until one day maybe he finds you on a beach and you find your calling, you find exactly what God wants you to do and you're like, God, I'm in, I'm sold out, let's go, let's do it. And you're gung-ho. But sometimes uh, others of us, maybe it's a little harder and maybe you need a little nudge like Saul. And uh, maybe you feel like you're on the right path. Maybe you feel like you're on God's path, but you're not. And I pray that in that time when you feel like you're on God's path and you're not, that God will blind you in the middle of a street if he has to, to show you exactly what he has for your life. And the reason I say that is because there's no greater will for your life 
um, no greater dream or plan that I can imagine, no better thing for myself than what God has for me. Sometimes we're kind of arrogant and we think that our plans are better. And we think that, that the things that we want for ourselves are obviously what would make us happy. Almost pretending as if we know what would be better for us than the guy who created this entire universe and everything that we are and everything that we have. I would trust that guy's plans over my plans any day of the week, and sometimes we just forget that. The best part about it is that God's dream for you, this, this picture that I'm painting of this, this great dream that can be no better, God's dream is not a, a matter of availability or proximity. God's dream is not hindered by your education, by your intelligence, by the amount of money you make, by your parents, by where you live, by nothing. It's just there in front of you, waiting to be accepted by you. The hard part, to surrender our own dreams in exchange for his, to give up ourselves for his wants and his desires for our lives. Now that last part, it's not very easy, giving up your own, your own wants and desires and replacing them with his. That is until you meet Jesus. Maybe on your road, maybe on your beach. But I hope that you do. That's all we have. <laughs>Great challenge. Great challenge. This week I had the opportunity to be challenged um, for our church. You know, when you're a pastor and you study and you share and you give out everything that you have, um, sometimes it becomes redundant in what you have within you to give out. And uh, there was a few sessions that gave me some inspiration, some motivation and challenged me to do certain things. And in doing that, I was thinking about the path that the graduates are on. There's no difference between being an 18-year-old young man that's, or young lady that's going into college or going into the workforce, and you have your whole future ahead of you. There's no difference between an 18-year-old doing that and a 49-year-old, almost 50, I got 30 more days, uh, a 50-year-old looking at the rest of his life. And I was challenged, as I need to challenge you. The last 20 years of my work career is just as important as my first 20 years. And I should be just as motivated to do what God wants me to do from the last 20 years as I was when I first said yes to do what God has called me to do. So how do I do that? How do I stay motivated how do I stay focused? How do I stay energized? How do I complete my race? And the only answer I can have is I have to be willing to change. I have to be willing to do what God has called me to do because God loves me just as much when I'm 49 as he did when I was 18. God's plan hasn't changed for me when I was 18 as I am in 49. My will has to be, Lord, I'm not going to be stuck in my rut I'm not going to stay doing the same thing over and over because that's all I know and that's what I'm good at. What I have to do is I have to say, Lord, get me, get me out of my comfort zone. Let, let me do something fresh. Let me challenge the way that you want me to challenge. So I was motivated and I was challenged in this area. I want to rock your world. I want, I want Glenville to be so unique, so focused about the future, about next year. I want the, the family of God to have a passion for God that is like, we can't wait to see what God is going to do. We are going to do things that God could open up the windows of heaven and bless us that we can't even comprehend or imagine. Now, that's our prayer. Now, you may be a visitor here and you say, well, good, I hope Glenville does that. But if you're a member here, I want you to know it is our job to reach this world. It's not the church's job to come to church on Sunday morning. It is the church's job to do the unusual, the unique, the necessary to do whatever it takes 
to come into a place where God's word could be breathed into people's lives. That's our job. And if we do not take our job seriously, now it's not just the pastor. I have, I have, a, I have a responsibility to be the leader to motivate that. But my job is to motivate, to, to bring into fruition the will of God within our church's life. To get out of the ordinary. To get rid of the usual. To not stay in the comfortable. To, to do something that is awe-inspiring takes risks. It takes a challenge. It takes the ability to fail. And if we don't take risks, we will fail. There's a book that, that I have read over the last few years. And the book is um, The Sacred Art of Cow Tipping. <laughs> Sounds like a weird book, doesn't it? The Sacred Art of Cow Tipping. You know, back in the day, if you have any age at all, you remember that there was a church, and the church had a little platform. And on this side of the church, they had the organ. Remember the organs? This side of the church had the piano. And they haven't been moved for 50 years. And if you move that piano or if you move that organ... The church is going to split right down the middle. They had plaques on the wall. They had curtains in the windows. If you touched anything that anybody in the church ever bought, they're going to get mad. They had the names of the pews, whoever donated the pew, and that name was on the side of that pew. And if you touched their pew, they're going to get mad. The church became inside a sacred cow. It became such a sacred cow that nobody from the outside of the church could come into the church because it was our church. It was our church. What we have to do is we have to be willing to say, there are no sacred cows. You are the only sacred cow that God cares about. The sacred cow, what I'm talking about, is God wants your soul. And he wants you to be so sold out. He will do anything he can do to keep you and to love you and to help you. But the key is, he doesn't just love you. He loves the 17-year-old grunge kid as much as he loves the 80-year-old man that has sacrificed his entire life for the body of Christ. You may have given millions of dollars to the church. You know what? God loves you. But you know what? He also loves the struggling little kid over here that doesn't know anything about Jesus. And the church needs to love that 80-year-old man, but he needs to love that 17-year-old kid. Because God does. But if we only focus on the old, we will never have a church that's in changing, that's impacting, that's doing exactly what God wants us to do. What do we do? We have to get on our hearts and our knees before God and say, Lord, how? How can we as the body of Christ do the miraculous? It's not the preacher. It's not the music. It's not the drama. It's not the choir. It's not the Sunday school teachers. It's going to be the people in the pews that have a passion and a burning desire to be a church that Jesus shows up to. That when people's lives are transformed. So what we want to do over the, over the whole summer months, we're, we're going to use two different vehicles in order to do this. Um, we're going to preach a series over a three-month period on creating culture. It's going to be a very simple sermon. What is the church supposed to do? How are we supposed to be a church? What did Jesus do? for? What, what's this whole concept of church all about? Because I believe our civilization as we know it we don't get church. We, 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 we have a misperception of what I believe God really wants the church to be. And the church has to be focused, guided, directed, deep into the will of God. We're not talking 30 people. We're talking how are we going to get 600 people to have a passion for God and to love for God to the point that it is their drive. It is their focus. 
And if I say this with any due respect, it's, there has to be buy-in. John, Mc, John Maxwell uses different phrases, and the law of buy-in is the law of this. You have to be invested. I have to be invested. If I invest sweat equity into Glenville, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to care what Glenville does because it's mine. I, I, I sacrifice for it. I give to it. I, I work in it. So I have sweat equity into it. So what I, I want it to be successful. I want it to drive. I want it to thrive. I want it to be what God wants it to be. And I'm asking you, I want sweat equity from everybody within this church. I want us to get on our knees before God and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? How can I do Glenville in the future? And, you know, I would love for our church to one day just be so uniquely gifted that it makes no difference whether you've been here 50 years or you're saved and you're here for the first time in your life that this becomes the family that God has brought you to. And when we become a family, you know, I've got some weird family members. I'm going to probably take this off of the DVD when I send it out but because my brothers may hear this, but i got some weird family members. I mean, they are weird. But you know what? They're my family. Talk to them on the phone. They call me and they have a problem. We talk a lot. And you know what? I'd like, you know what? You're weird. But you know what? They're my family. I'll talk to them. I may not agree with everything they do, but I'm going to love them. I'm going to work with them. I'll sacrifice for them. And we are the spiritual family that God has brought together. I want to see where God is going to take us into the future. See, this is a, a catalyst moment, a motivating moment, a stirring moment to our church. If you look on a normal Sunday right now, we are way past the, the average mark of what they would consider overcrowded so the church would become stagnated. It's that 75 to 82 percent of the church full. When the parking lot is 80 percent full, we become to the point that we started to stagnate. Now, if you're growing, that's great, but once you stagnate, that's bad because the next step after stagnation is decline. So as we are growing, before we stagnate, we have to make an adjustment. We have to decide what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. So over this next three months, I want you, as members of the church, to pray with me. To say, we're going to take this summer, and we're going to evaluate everything that we need to look at in order to make this church, your church, a church that's ready to move into the future. A church that is saying, okay, that was a good trip, Lord. I loved what you've done in my past. I am ready to graduate and open the door into the future. And you are needed. We can't do this without you. I want to motivate, I want to communicate the, the, the purpose of the entity called the church. And I want to inspire you to know God has a plan for you. And you are not somebody that's taken up a chair in the auditorium. You are a saint of God that God is going to use to reach other people for the cause of Jesus Christ. Our Christian faith in our world today is this. I go to church. Okay? What else? Well, I go to church. I'm there at 1030 every Sunday morning. I, I sing songs. That's your faith? That's what Christianity has been boiled down to? Is I go to church on Sunday morning for an hour and a half? If that is what the culture sees in the church, that Christianity changes over an hour and a half period on a Sunday morning, the church has drastically failed God. God is never going to fail the church. But what I believe God wants our church to be, the body of Christ to be, is a living, growing organism that communicates 
the forgiveness, the grace, and the love of God to a point when somebody walks in the door and they are not anything like you. What it does, it's an opportunity not to shun them, but to love them. It's an opportunity so God can show his grace to them. When they walk in the door, they don't have to worry about the, the roof falling in. Oh, I've never been to church. You know what? We've got plenty of pillars to hold the roof up. I would never say that. Come down here and sit, the, sit on the front row. Let me, let me do something for you. Let's minister. Let's take what the church is supposed to be and move it into the center of God's will at Glenville. Give me that chance. There's moments in people's lives where they have to make decisions. Decisions sometimes are very difficult because decisions change routes. They change the way you travel, highways. And uh, I don't know, you know this, but I'm turning in a very, in, in 25 days or so, I'm turning the big 50. And anytime you turn 50, for all you old folks out there, anytime you turn 50, it's one of those years you say, wow. Patty, I, I know you know what this is talking about, Patty. But, but <laughs> that's, a, that's a decisive time. And you, you, we go to this conference, and I'm just going to share here for a second. We go to this conference, and we get down to the conference. I'm, I'm in this room. I'm, I'm going over everything that we lear learned for the last three or four days. And it's, it's me and God time. Me and God time, it's not good for me sometimes. <laughs> but uh, you start thinking, okay, you're 50. Um, you've been to this church for 15 years. Um, you don't want to hurt the church by staying too long. Uh, a younger man can do more and better things than you can do. What do you do? What do you do? And I have to make a decision, or I had to make a decision, what do I do? And the decision that I have made is I want to finish well. I want to be known as the pastor of this church that did not quit. But at the last phase of his ministry, of his ministry of his life, was just as good, was just as powerful, was just as uh, motivating and visionary as the first 15 years of his ministry. And how I do that is I have to get in tune with God, communicate to the body of Christ, and it has to be a team effort. Because I want this church to be transformed, not only in numerical growth, but inspiration to every person that you come in contact with. That when they hear the name Glenville, they don't think of the church. They think about the lives that the church has changed. They think about your testimony. They think about your willingness to, to love and to help. That's a door that we have to go through. That's a door that I'm challenged to make happen. It's going to be difficult. There's going to be things I don't like. There's going to be things that you don't like. And you know what? That's okay. Because we have to remember, we have a wide variety of age groups, but God loves the 13-year-old as much as he loves the 9-year-old. The 90-year-old may not like everything that the 13-year-old likes, but the 13-year-old's not going to like everything that the 90-year-old likes. But here's the greatest plan that God has. The Holy Spirit of God lives within every believer. And if we have the spirit of humility, spirit of love, I can look at any person, and I may not like everything about them and what they do, but I can love them. I can allow them my help. I can give to them encouragement. I don't have to listen to their music. I don't have to look at their dress. I don't care if they have tattoos, or earrings, no rings, and I don't care what they look like. God loves deeper than the outward appearance, which is the soul. And I believe God looks at the soul of a church and he is saddened when the soul of the church condemns a soul that is not even reached. I believe it puts a smile on God's face when the church, those that have already been redeemed by God's love and forgiveness and grace, opens the door and says, I have something for you.
and to extend to them the greatest thing that could ever be extended is love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Let's be transformed. Let's do church different. Let's do life pleasing to God. The next three months, we're going to do two different things. Sunday mornings, we're going to proclaim the message. This is going to start in June. Uh, about the church atmosphere, behavior, purpose. What are we going to do? I want to teach us and me at the same time what we're supposed to do. How can we evangelize? Some of it's old school, some of it's new school, but it's all from God's school. And I think it's very important. And on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock, we're going to, it's going to be kind of unique. We're going through, can you throw me a thing here? I can catch it. We're going to, the, the DVD series, The Bible. Um, it's just the story that has gone through, and we all watched the mini ser- series on the Bible. We watched it at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. This was a great idea that somebody came up with and told me about. We're going to take a clip, not the whole movie. We're going to take a clip, each story. And on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock, we're going to show the clip of the movie. And then we're going to teach what the Bible teaches that the movie didn't show. We're not going to be diplomatic about it. We're going to be doctrinal about it. What is behind the story? Because the story did bring the Bible to life for a lot of people. It was really good. But why? Why did they do that? Where, where was that at? What was the reason behind that? Who was that character? How does that character apply here? And we're going to take those different sections, and we're going to watch the movie, and then we're going to tell you the story behind the story. And the story behind the story is what does the Bible truly say? It's a good foundation what we're going to do is we're going to bring all the adults into the auditorium. We're going to bring um, we're going to bring the adults into the auditorium, and we're going to teach this. The youth ministry will be going over the same material. The children's ministry will be going over the same material. So every class will be doing the same material at nine o'clock on Sunday morning, just so we can go through the Bible systematically and see what God is teaching us, so we can learn the Bible. It's very important to learn the Bible. And then when we come into church, we're going we're gonna to do church different. We're going to glorify God. You know, doctrines never change. I'm, I'm, I'm so baptistic, that's all I know, that's what I believe the Bible teaches. So my doctrine will never change. That's who I am. But my expression for my love for my Father, the expression I have for the church, the way that we want to unify the body so we can bring glory to Him, if it's not working, Something has to change. Let's open the door and let God shine in and see what God can do. I, you know, I'm very happy with the way the church is growing. I'm happy with that. I'm not satisfied with it. Because once we become satisfied, we become stagnant. Let's go. Let's, let's take the momentum that God has put within our church, within our life, and go to the next level and do something great and mighty for God. Let's go, Lord, and pray. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. Lord, we thank you for the, the turning within our soul. Lord, the vision that you have laid out in front of our church. Lord, please give us clarity. Lord, allow us to open the door and light in front of us, the steps we must take. I ask us to, even as Ben has called Saul, that Saul was blinded. But then when he opened his eyes, he was seeing things in a new perspective. I want our church to open their eyes, me as a pastor, to open our eyes and to see what you want us to do. How you want us to go, how you want us to extend grace, how you want us to lead, how you want us to do great and mighty things. Lord, give us that desire. Lord, give me as the leader of the church with humble authority, give me the inspiration to walk and to lead in your way so others will see this is what you want. And this is how you want them to go. Lord, be with us today. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray.
Amen. Pastor Al.